All right, let's go ahead and get started. That's why Ryan keeps yawning. <laughs> Somebody notices, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for joining me, everyone. For many of you, you may know that I am Zia Freeman. I'm with Coordinated Care. I am a community educator. Of course, we know that Coordinated Care provides the health care for children in foster care across Washington State. So the entire state, all 39 counties are covered with that. We also, of course, cover alumni, which is 18 to 25 year olds, extended foster care, mini adoption support families, and we provide coverage for children who return home to their birth family for one year after that dependency is dismissed. We also at Coordinated Care do provide general Medicaid to folks. So if there is a need uh, to have insurance and someone may have lost their job, lost their insurance that way, or they just have a little bit lower income and so now could qualify, that is one of the plans they can choose from. And then we also have Ambetter that is on the exchange as insurance as well. So that's what this managed care organization does primarily. My role is that I am a community educator and I provide trauma-informed trainings. And we were brought on to provide that for caregivers and the professionals that work with caregivers. And that is primarily who I see, but I also am uh, doing trainings for doctors or therapists, uh, people who work in academic settings, really anyone who works with kids who come from a background of trauma and need a little bit more support in that area. So please feel free if in your other life, other than being a CASA, uh, you know of an organization that could benefit from these free of charge trainings, you are welcome to let me know. Tonight, we're going to talk about attachment and bonding beyond infancy, meaning we're going to talk mostly about youth who are over age two or three. And I really would love it if you ask questions, feel free to put things in the chat box, or there's not that many of us, you can unmute yourself and just ask a question. Don't worry about interrupting me. I would like that participation with you. And I want to be able to tailor this to the folks that you might have an age range uh, in mind that you're thinking you might be serving families that have teenagers or serving a family who have the four or five-year-olds and you want a little more uh, information along those lines. And so certainly uh, speak up and give me your opinion and your thoughts on this. I will give you the PowerPoint when we are done. I'll put it in the chat box and I'll also give you my email so uh, you can contact me for further information and uh, anything like that. So let's go ahead and jump into this. I will turn off my video because it distracts me as a trainer, but please feel free to leave yours on if you wish. That does not bother me at all. And uh, again, please participate. I rather know that you're out there rather than me just talking to myself because I can lecture till the cows come home. Uh, so I want your questions and your thoughts. All right. Attachment does happen to be one of my specialties, so I'm very pleased to share this with you. I do love this topic. It is so important that we learn about it, and we're going to talk about that and go through the cycle of healthy and unhealthy attachment. And again, your thoughts and opinions and experiences certainly are worth putting out there. Bottom line is that attachment is the foundation of all we do in relationship to others, in both children and adults. So it's not just the kids attaching to their foster parents or their new adoptive parent. It is with our coworkers, it's with our friends, it's with your adult romantic relationships. And so this is something that when we are very small, we develop that foundation and we take it forward into our life. Now that doesn't mean that for our kids, who may have come from a background of trauma, in fact, let's be honest, most of the time they do, uh, that they're not going to have challenges. It doesn't mean they're not going to go on to have healthy relationships later on in life, but it is something that we need to have an awareness of, that the majority of our youth are going to struggle with attachment due to their history. And of course, we are placing these children with strangers, right? Except for perhaps kinship, but even then they may be with a stranger. And so these children are struggling to develop that new relationship and the parents are as well. So your role is a CASA. Uh, and if you have a different role than that, please feel free to let us know in the chat box. Uh, but your role is to support both child and family to be able to help make this happen because oftentimes this is at the core of disruption where children who are struggling with attachment and or those caregivers 
they kind of have enough and then the child ends up being moved out because it can be pretty challenging to live with someone that you really have not developed an emotional connection to. First of all, how do we become attached? Well, it is experience uh, that we had when we uh, were young and then that goes on to how we parent children. So if you were raised in a warm and fuzzy atmosphere with the people that perhaps you were born to or you were adopted at a very tiny age, um, and you lived consistently with those people and they were fairly healthy, well, you probably have a fairly healthy attachment style, though there is uh, some research that says actually only about 30% of us truly have a healthy attachment style. But that is all a little bit relative to who's involved in the situation. Also, we need to consider how old is the child at time of placement? Whether or not it is foster care or a child who's being placed for adoption at an older age or kinship, bottom line is age does have a lot to do with it, not everything. And this, I would like to emphasize this. Attachment is not based on our blood ties to someone, okay? It really does focus more on what is the stage of development and the age of the child when they go to live with this new family. So for example, if you get a three month old, of course, attachment's going to go much faster. It's going to be much easier. A three-year-old's gonna take a little bit longer, but again, overall, it's gonna be pretty simple. But if you're talking about a 13-year-old, well, this could be uh, something that may take a while and it may never look quite the same as a child who was placed with a family when they were much younger. So many things do impact that, not just our age, but our temperament. We are all born with certain temperaments. It doesn't mean our personalities don't develop and change based on environment. I don't particularly believe that we are completely born with a certain personality, but we do have certain tendencies such as some are a little more laid back. Uh, some might naturally be a little bit more outgoing no matter what their experiences. And so temperament of a child uh, certainly plays into this. Then there is genetics. Well, what did we inherit? That, of course, is race. That can be our health issues. And this can be impactful. That also uh, is something that plays between our ears, right? What did we inherit from uh, parent A and parent B get together and they make child C? What did that child inherit from both of them? And if the child has health issues, or there might be uh, brain damage, cognitive issues, or just frankly, some challenges that are unforeseen yet, well, that can play into this as well. And then there's experiences. And this is very prominent within this cup with these kids because their experiences really do impact how they come to the table. If they moved into a foster home directly from a birth family, and let's say that family was intervened on pretty early and that child's only a year old. Well, the chances of that child having a lot of challenges uh, attaching are pretty minimal, right? Because they didn't have lots of time of poor experiences. But let's say a child is six years old. They have been, unfortunately, abused and or neglected. And then they move into foster care. And then for whatever reason, they are moved from home to home to home. And we've all seen this occur. Well, that child's going to have a whole different can of worms for experiences, aren't they? They're going to come to the table with some serious baggage. And this is going to be a tough one. And so we have to understand that that plays a big part with these kids. And we need to know it. Just because they're children doesn't mean that they are completely flexible and able to just roll with every situation. Now, of course, having said all that, there are exceptions to the rule on all of this, but uh, those things do play a big part in what happens with our children. Well, let's talk about cycle of healthy attachment. And all of you have probably seen some variation of this. We are part of the mammal kingdom. We are animals at heart. And so like all mammals, we are not born out of an egg. We are not born self-sufficient. Whether you're talking about a baby squirrel or a kitten or a human being, that little one, of course, are born with needs and we're not able to care for ourselves. And so when we have a need, let's talk about humans, of course, what do we do to show that need when we are an infant? You can put it in the chat box or you can just speak out loud. We cry, right. And let's say 
uh, mom and or dad are tired and they're in bed and they're kind of waiting for the other parent to go pick up that kid and, and soothe them, right? Um, or they just didn't hear them right away. What does that baby do if you don't respond right away to that crying? What often occurs to express that need? And it's pretty simple. They cry louder, right? They can get that piercing shriek going on. And we all certainly have heard the cries of newborns. I bet all of you can go to a grocery store and if you hear a newborn crying in another aisle, you know there's a difference to that sound and you say to yourself, there's somebody who hasn't been on this earth for very long, right? And it is the same, again, if you're experienced with tiny animals, if you've ever had a litter, um, if you've ever raised you know, little tiny ones, uh, kittens, puppies, they definitely have different cries too. And so this child really gets loud and they say, hey, get in here through this crying, get in here and change me, feed me, hold me, I have this need. So the usual healthy parent runs in there and they pick up the child and they cuddle them and they change them and feed them and snuggle with them and the child gets quiet ah oh, my ears feel better and they nestle against that caregiver and the child feels better and the parent feels good and they smile at the child and of course very quickly into infancy children start smiling back they are mimicking that from their parents and so both are feeling a whole lot better about each other. There is trust being built and the child learns uh, be, by their needs being met that, oh, I kind of understand how the world works. And the child learns that from a very young, even a few days old. They understand that when I cry, here comes this nice man and he feeds me. Oh, I cry and now oh, this nice lady comes in here and she picks me up and holds me. And they see the same faces over and over. And they have the consistency to know that most of the time when I'm upset and I have a need, one of these people come in here or one or three, you know, whoever may be hopefully in the household with some consistency. So this child very quickly learns they have an impact on the world. They kind of know uh, what cause and effect is. They get a sense of how things are and they feel uh, comforted and they feel secure because they know what to do to help themselves a little bit. And it is amazing cycle, but that's how we get our needs met because we need to be able to do that for others to take care of us. And of course, as time goes by, the parents feel very good about themselves because they feel pretty confident they know what's going on and the attachment is building on their side as well. They feel good about themselves. They feel happy about this child. They feel secure in their ability to parent most of the time. And this is a very nice upward cycle that intertwines and is very positive. And of course, as the years go by, parents do this many, many, many times with their children. And so this child is able to go to a preschool or kindergarten if they didn't do the earlier years and they sit in class and the teacher might say okay everybody let's kind of pull it together and be quiet we're going to start an activity and the child thinks oh well I don't have any reason to doubt that this nice person uh, is got anything out for me right so I will follow their rules and what teacher doesn't love a child who follows the rules and so the teacher smiles at a child who may be sitting there quietly at their desk waiting for things to start and the child smiles back and they have this sense of connection to each other, right? Because, well, every adult in my world has been trustworthy, so why shouldn't I be willing to do that here? And of course, as time goes by, their relationships are fairly good unless somebody actually shows that they are unsafe or inappropriate, children often come to the table with a general trust, and therefore they meet uh, kind of that positive energy back. Well, we have children, of course, that are going to be in our system, and they're going to be on your caseload, and those kids still had those needs way back when, before you met them. They express that need in the same way. Well, if they were born to a parent who was a drug addict, well, that person might be kind of out cold. They're sleeping so hard they don't hear that baby cry, and the child just lays there screaming at night or even during the day, and nobody comes in to pay attention to them. Or perhaps that parent is coming down off of some drug, and they've got a splitting headache, and they're really wanting their next fix, 
that is their focus. And this child is screaming and they go into the bedroom, they pick up that child, they may yell at them, give them a little shake, toss them back in their crib and say, you know, shut up. So the child may learn, oh, crying isn't safe. Maybe I need to just be very, very quiet, right? Or perhaps it is a person that uh, they're immature. They're, they just had a child when they were way too young. They're 14 years old and they're tired and they're busy on their phone and that kid's yelling and they're like, oh, I'll get in there in a minute, right? Part of my adoption experience is with international. And this certainly shows up there too. For those of you who understand that, you go to an orphanage to adopt a child and it's not like those children are not cared for by people, but they are staff. And there's often a few nannies and a lot of babies, right? And so children often learn that, oh, well, today I cry and nobody comes and I go to sleep and then somebody comes and wakes me up and feeds me. Well, that's a little confusing. And then tomorrow though, when I cry because I'm wet, oh, somebody changed me right away. Well, that's great. But then three hours later when I'm wet, I end up being wet for quite a while. And again, my crying doesn't seem to make much difference. So whether a child grew up in an orphanage for a while, or they were in foster care or living with dysfunctional family, uh, children often have these skewed ideas of the world. They don't really understand cause and effect. Uh, these babies are like, well, I cry. Sometimes it works for me. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's just wasting my energy. Uh, other times it may be very helpful, but I don't know. Or they may see a lot of strangers cycling in and out of their room. Uh, maybe they have parents that live with a lot of other people or they get moved around within the birth family and they live uh, with a birth parent today. And then tomorrow I'm with a grandparent. And then two weeks from now I'm living with some aunt and I don't really know all these people. And then of course, children go into foster care. And again, who is this person? And they do things differently and I don't understand it. So a child then, their need may be delayed in being met because again, if they were in an orphanage or they were with someone like in a hospital, uh, but they just didn't have somebody who was right there for them all the time, or they were with uh, a birth parent who just was very busy and or had some issues going on and didn't get them right away, or the need may not have been met at all. Well, as time goes by, this child becomes very trust distrusting. And that doesn't happen. I mean, it happens pretty quickly. And you've probably met those kids, the two to three-year-olds who don't want anything to do with people touching them, uh, who look at you with such suspicion and distaste that it's amazing they're as young as they are. Um, and then they go to school, they go to preschool, they go to kindergarten, and the teacher says, okay, everybody pull it together, we're going to do this activity, everybody be quiet, sit down. Well, this child hasn't had great experience with adults being trustworthy, so why should I stop playing with this toy? Why should I stop talking to my little friend over here and do what this person wants? I don't know you. Why should I care what you want from me? And so, of course, the, the teacher may have to intervene on their behavior. And that isn't fun, even though the teacher may be tolerant. Well, that's just not probably going to be my favorite student if this kid constantly uh, is going against what I want. And so children often experience then that the world, sure enough, is not as warm and fuzzy as they might like for it to be. And then they move into foster care, and oftentimes uh, they tend to get a little bit disagreeable with their foster parents. They tend to say things they shouldn't be saying. They interrupt a lot. They don't seem to understand what's going on in the room. Uh, they may be crying about nothing. They're, ha they're clean, they're dry, uh, they don't know what's wrong with them, you know, and the parent gets frustrated because they don't get a successful feeling from this child. Even if that person's a parent already, like, well, this foster kid doesn't respond the way my other kids did. And so maybe it's me or maybe it's them. And sometimes we all know this ends up being a situation where sometimes children get moved. Okay, well, we, of course, have went through this. I went through it in that one screen, but ultimately children too have that inner voice that says, you've got to take care of yourself, right? You need to control your own life. And so that little voice gets louder and stronger. And with those little ones, it can be the child who doesn't want you to touch them, the child that you want to hold their hand going across the street and they pull away from you. I've had so many foster parents say to me, 
gosh, Zia, I felt like I was going to break her little arm because she she would just pull away from me and I'd have to hang on to her so tight. Or I spend more time clinging to her jacket because she will not let me hold her hand. Or these are the kids the parent might get to that monkey backpack, right, where you hold on to the tail. Or the actual little harness. And people, of course, frown at you when they see you have a little harness on your child because oftentimes people who are especially not parents say, well, that's not a dog you have there. But for some people, this is the only way to keep this kid uh, close at hand if you can't carry them all the time. And when you're talking about three, four, five-year-olds, well, they can get darn heavy, right? And so this can be hard because you've got a child that questions everything you do. And that gets tiring to a parent. Why is this kid questioning what I'm feeding them? Where we're going to go? Uh, why should I do this? Or maybe they even get to the point of saying something like, no, you want me to do that? I'm not going to. Well, it's all driven from that attachment style and the fact that they don't feel uh, secure and they feel anxious. What we want our caregivers to know is this is normal. It is normal to not be attached to these children when they're first placed with you. It is normal for these children to not be attached to that caregiver. This is how they experience the world. So actually, well, they're smart little people, aren't they? They understand, just like when uh, little ones go and they touch that hot, that hot stove, no matter how much we may watch them, right? And they go, owie. Well, they probably learn not to do that again. So they haven't been treated well. Well, now they've learned to push back a little bit and to be leery of those adults. So it actually is a smart thing, but it doesn't feel very good when the child doesn't seem to be responding to the parent. And of course, the parent may feel, oh, no, I'm terrible at this. I don't seem to be as attached to this child as I am to the birth children I've had. Well, no wonder you've had those kids in your home since day one. And again, remember, some people connect this to the fact that those are my birth children. No, no, no. Blood doesn't really have anything to do with it. It has to do with the age the child was placed with you. So if another child is placed with you within hours of coming into this world, unless, of course, they had health issues, they would probably respond to you quite in the similar way as a child born to you. And so we want our families to know this is normal. You're not going to have um, an immediate attachment. And oftentimes people's fantasy of being a foster parent or an adoptive parent is that, of course, I'm so amazing with my other kids, or I know I'm going to be an amazing caregiver, uh, that they're a little bummed out. They're disappointed. And they may really question, why am I doing this? It feels like I'm taking care of uh, a stranger's kid. Well, you know what you are. And I just have always, always shared, please know this is normal. There's nothing wrong with you that you're not immediately attached. There's nothing wrong with the child in the sense that this is normal based on their background. And so it's okay, right? There is no such thing as love at first sight. That is a chemical reaction to something that pleases us. You know, would you say, Oh my gosh, that dog that just bit me at the Humane Society, that's the one that I absolutely adore. Now, you may take it home and work with it, but you're probably not real crazy about it. You're a little suspicious of it, right? Versus the puppy that you pick up who licks your face and is all wiggly and fat and adorable. Well, you say, oh, I was just in love with that puppy from the beginning. Well, people say that about children too, or they say that about some beautiful studly person when they're young that they want to date, right? So we have to remember, we are a little bit shallow as mammals. We look at one another based on what is attractive to us, and we say, oh, it must be love, and I'm bringing fantasies to the table. Well, it's okay when some of those fantasies fall apart a little bit, and we are going to normalize that. So help your caregivers to know they're not doing anything wrong because they still feel more connection to kids who've been in their home longer than this new one. Key points to remember is what was the history with that child? Because parents and kids respond according to that bond established in those early relationships. Now, again, it doesn't mean that a child who was neglected and or abused will never have a healthy relationship. No, no, it doesn't mean that. 
but it does mean they need to expect there will be challenges. Uh, when I used to do new parent preparation before I came to coordinated care, here was one of my standard sentences. Everyone in the room listening to me right now, you are going to get a child who has some attachment concerns. Doesn't mean disorder, let's not go there. It doesn't mean RAD, which stands for Reactive Attachment Disorder. Uh, that's a soapbox I can get on for another time. Bottom line is though, you will have some attachment issues and if you are prepared for it and you're accepting of it, it's going to go smoother for you versus thinking, oh my, within two weeks or two months, this kid's gonna be totally attached to me, okay? Difficulties, of course, will occur because of neglect, abuse, and repeated trauma. And that is the majority of children that come into the system. Kids rarely come into the system because their parents died in a car crash, right? They are not just here because they're orphans. These children, those children go to aunts, uncles, grandparents. These children have come generally from challenges. Someone said, I'll hop on that rad soapbox with you. Yeah, yeah, Ryan. I really do not believe, we over, over, over diagnose that with these kids. On one hand, you could say, sure, majority of them look like they have RAD if you look at the list of uh, the symptoms. But on the other hand, no, they're, they're, this is not a permanent situation. We just have to acknowledge where they're coming from, okay. Now, children cannot be disciplined or talked out of attachment. If you took my food and uh, hygiene training at some point, you know I say the same thing. You can't talk a child out of feeling like, where's the next meal if they haven't had food in their life very much? So you cannot say to a child, honey, you're safe here with me. You're safe in our family. We're going to take care of you. We're going to be here. Y you can say that. You can encourage your caregivers to say that, sure. But they need to not put a lot of stock into that kid believing it because these children have been told things that may not have come to pass. Oh, I really love you, but I'm an addict. And so therefore I lose my temper with you if I am you know, running out of drugs or if I've had too many drugs or I'm going to adopt you. Oh, not so much. I guess we're not gonna adopt you. We're moving you to a new home. I mean, the bottom line is words are cheap, aren't they? It is what people show to one another. And so you can say to a child, honey, this is a great home you're in. I really like these foster parents you have, but uh, you know, so you need to just accept that for me. Well, that kid's gonna probably look at you whether they're three or 13 and go, uh-huh. And of course, the older they are, the more skeptical they're going to be. And you cannot discipline them out of it. You cannot say, oh, you don't want me to hug you? Well, then I'm not gonna hug you. Or you're gonna be snotty about something that I just gave you? Well, then you go sit in your room for a while, right? That, that's not gonna help it either because this is our internal body, our internal control system saying, take care of yourself because others have let you down and we have to show up and just keep going through it. Now, nobody said it's easy, but that's what we need to do. And of course, everybody's different. I've worked in this field for an amazing amount of years. It just ages me like crazy. Uh, but the bottom line is, I have seen kids who have come from the most hellacious backgrounds go into a family, perhaps for adoption or just foster care, but they just based on their personality and how they interpret it. And of course, the people they're living with, they kind of slide in without a whole lot of issue. And you're like, wow, that's amazing. And then other children that may really have not suffered as much as one might think in the grand scheme of things, boy, they have challenges for years and years and years. And so, of course, it is a little different, and we're talking about the dynamic of the whole family they're moving into, in addition to the emotional baggage that we each bring to a relationship. And you might want to think about it in adult terms. For any of you who are not parents, uh, or you remember this, think about it as if you meet someone, they've never been married before, they've never lived with anybody uh, they've had a good upbringing and you fall in love and you decide to live together or get married. This is nice, right? You may have some ups and downs, but that's the reality of a relationship. Well, you take uh, another person who's been married four times and every time that relationship seemed to end, it seemed like maybe there was something else going on, like somebody died 
or that person uh, had an affair and left that person. And so now they're ready to marry you, but they're going to bring with them all the ghosts of those past relationships. And you better believe that no matter how much they think they love you or you love them, those things are going to still be at play here. Do they deserve to have a, a family? Of course they do. And have a marriage that is good? Of course they do. But it's like the child or the little dog or the little cat that you adopt. If you adopt that grown dog or that grown cat and they have not been treated well in their past, well, they're going to be taken a while before they really love you. And some of you have probably adopted some difficult animals too. And so you can sometimes see where we share some of those same tendencies with other mammals, whether we've been abused or not abused and not or, or neglected. So consistency and nurturing can change this pattern. Again, whether you're talking about a human or a puppy, right? But we have to know it's not going to be a smooth road all of the time. And we have to look at the age of the child. If you've got a foster parent who says, I really enjoy teenagers, wonderful, but they need to know that no matter how perfect they are, that 13-year-old is not going to probably develop the same relationship with them as they would if they had been placed at age three. And that's just a reality. It's not bad. It's not good. It's just what it is. And we need to not compare that to Oh, well, you know, I got a kid at age three, and by the time he was 13, he was fabulous. Well, there's a whole different uh, thing going on there. So I want your input here. So everybody, wake up, wake up. A child whose needs are met see adults themselves in the world as what? How does a child see themselves who generally get their needs met? How do they see themselves, the world, adults, parents? What do they see for, for themselves? Trustworthy, confident, valued, content. Yes, they see themselves this way. They see the world is fairly trustworthy. Why shouldn't I trust that kindergarten teacher? Most adults have been pretty nice to me, right? What about the child whose needs are not met or who are greatly delayed throughout their life? or moved around a lot. How do they see adults themselves or the world? Hostile, scary, yes, yes, no trust, right. Takes a while to develop, unreliable, uh-huh. Oh yeah, you're nice to me today, but what about tomorrow? Kids are very detached, yes. Uh, and of course, that can show up emotionally, but it often shows up physically. Do not hug me. I may hug you once in a while, but don't you hug me. Anger. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> oh, boy, have we seen that. And the older the kids get, often anger becomes more pronounced. And that is hard because that may be where they lose a home, too. Wow, this kid has gotten aggressive with us. They push away from developing relationships. Yes. And I bet almost all of you know some adult that you know probably had some challenges in their life and they may be the person who tend to sabotage uh, their adult relationships, who get very defensive with people, who tend to even get fired because they argue a lot with people in authority, uh, that they really struggle, right? And of course, if you wanna see people who have a lot of challenges like that, go to a jail because oftentimes these are people who push back on authority to the point that they end up getting themselves arrested and they participate in behaviors because they're like, I don't care about the world. I really don't. I'm just an angry person. And it is really hard to deal with that. All right. Here is a screen that shows you artwork that was done by uh, young people that grew up in foster care. The one on the left, I don't like the picture. I'm going to tell you that right now, but I love the words. They said I had attachment disorder. But really, I had a life disorder, and therefore, I attached accordingly. When I first saw that, I thought it was mind-blowing. It really was, because we give these kids attachment disorder diagnoses all the time. I've been a therapist. I've worked as a therapist. I'm licensed. And yes, I have laid that down, too, uh, as, a, as a diagnosis. And yeah, these kids often do fit it. Now, remember, that's different than rad. But Look at this. Really, I had a life disorder. Yeah, 
Look where you came from. Look how many people you've lived with. Some of these children, by the time they are age 10, have lived with more people and in more places than a lot of the adults that I'm probably talking to right now. And so I attached accordingly. Yeah, you did what you needed to survive. And so that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? And then the other one, I reinvent myself daily to deal with my reality. Boy, I know those kids. I really do. I miss that part. What is rad? Uh, reactive attachment disorder. It is considered the higher level of attachment issues, and it is a dumping ground for foster care and adoption. Uh, but that is, you know, my soapbox and apparently Ryan's as well. But there are a lot of people, caregivers and professionals, who say all oh, these kids all have reactive attachment doors disorder and they're never going to change. Well, that, I don't believe that is true. Uh, but look at this. I reinvent myself daily to deal with my reality. Yeah, I bet you've met those kids. I sure have. They're, I call them chameleons. They blend in. They're very good at schmoozing with the new caregivers and calling them mom and dad if they find out that that is kind of something that those people might like. And I've had caregivers say to me, oh, Zia, she has been here only a week and she called me mom. And of course, I, I never gave them the reaction they were hoping for because I said, well, that doesn't mean a whole lot. Sorry, I was, I was good at bursting people's bubbles. Uh, but bottom line is, kids are like, oh, sure. And also not calling the mom and dad doesn't mean they're not attaching too. Sometimes it just means I'm keeping it close to the chest and, you know, I'm kind of checking out what's going on here. So kids will adjust, don't they? You've met that child that you've interviewed and they might say everything they think you should hear. They may have been in therapy for so many years. Boy, they've got the lingo down, right? And you have the impression that you are not really talking to that real child. You're talking to whatever smoke screen they're throwing up at you. And so these are kids who are pretty savvy with the system and they know how to play the game. And is it any wonder they have to reinvent themselves every time they move? They have to find out where the towels are kept or what time is bedtime in this house or what kind of meals and snacks do we have in this home and what kind of rules do they have and what kind of moods are they in, right? All right, so a child who is struggling with attachment will resist cuddling. They resist eye contact. They won't seek comfort from a parent. These are the kids that have an owie on their head and they're actually bleeding or on their elbow because they fell off their bike or they just fell down and they'll run and hide and they won't show the parent that they have a big owie. And this is very normal for a child who doesn't trust the parent yet. They have strong control issues. What are we, where are we going? Why are we going there? I don't want to wear that. I don't want to eat that. I don't want to do that. No, I won't. No, I won't. This can be really challenging and exhausting, right? And pretty soon the parent gets into that uh, battle with them, those battle of power, and they feel like an absolute fool because they get down on that child's level and they forget who the adult is. But these kids really want to be in charge. Well, why do they want to do that? Well, we all want to take control of our life when it's been out of control. Think about someone, and maybe some of you have been there, have your house broken into. Oh my gosh, this is horrible. You feel intruded on. You, I, you may not feel safe. You're horrified someone was in your property, was in your home. And so what do people do? Well, sometimes they may say, we're getting an alarm system. We're going to get a big dog. We're going to buy a gun. We're going to be neurotic about locking our doors and locking our windows every time, right? I've had to work with my husband, not that we've had our home broken into, but he, we move over to this little town and he's suddenly like, ah, it's okay if we don't lock our doors. I said, that is not a good habit to get into, right? We need to lock our home up as though we still live in King County. No offense to those of you who are coming from King County uh, in that area, but you know, these kids, they just, they really are in control. And if that person was broken into, well, they would want to take control of their world. And that's a normal and good survival skill. So these children are trying to take control of their atmosphere, but they're kids. So they argue with you about what color their socks are 
because they believe if they give in to that caregiver, they actually lose. And if you lose, something bad happens. Uh, this child could also be very friendly with everybody. And I've had a lot of people say to me, oh my gosh, Zia, she's such a friendly girl. We go to town and she talks to everybody in the line and she talks to everybody in the mall. And uh, oh yeah, she'll even try and hold their hand or if we have company, she wants to sit on everybody's lap. And I generally would say that's not okay. It really is not okay if that child's only been with you a short time and this is what they're doing. That means that they are kind of working the room. They are really going to anybody and everybody for attention and they need to understand that, you know, you don't go to strangers for hugs, okay? They need to know you go to your caregiver and that means we need to develop more uh, trust. Now, it doesn't mean that the child might ultimately not be social, but if you've got a kid in your, uh, on your caseload who's climbing all over you and they've never laid eyes on you, that's not a great sign. Uh, you may be very wonderful and cuddly and great with kids, but we should still know that this is an attachment concern. Uh, they can also be in your face, meaning that they are terrified to let that caregiver get out of their face or out of their sight. I have known kids who've had meltdowns on the other side of the bathroom door because mom or dad are in the bathroom, whoever they have kind of connected to initially, and they can't see them, and they're just having a meltdown. Now, of course, it's little kids. You're not seeing teenagers doing that, but even teenagers can show a way of, uh, no, do not leave me by, my, by myself, right? Of course, someone's licensed. They shouldn't be leaving their kids by themselves, uh, but these children often are just terrified of this. I had a family that I would go visit uh, as a social worker, of course, just checking in, see how they're doing. And I would come in for my visit and I was there every month. And uh, this parent, the child, I'd ring the doorbell and you'd hear the child screaming. The child was about two years old and they would just be crying and screaming. And the parent said to me, Zia, don't take it personally. She does this with everybody except me and my husband. She said, if UPS delivers a package, she screams. If my mom comes over, she screams. And so that was a sign of a child that you know, really was terrified of the whole world. And definitely she was a clinger. She clung to her mom a whole lot. And mom said, you know, it's really hard for me to be out of the room even with her or leave her with my husband in the living room while I go put a load of laundry in because they get really scared and nervous about that. So what do we do about all this? We've talked about how awful this is. This is scary. This is normal, right? Well, first of all, you want to have a calm and quiet home environment. I know, easier said than done. But a family that has lots of kids, no matter where they come from, lots of people going in and out, lots of busyness, parents that are traveling for work, perhaps, or other reasons, that's really hard. It really is. Ideally, you want the family to be consistent and have a reliable routine. Families who have fostered a lot of kids or adopted children often say they've got the most boring house on the planet. We eat dinner at the same time. We don't have a lot of company at our house. We go socialize elsewhere. Uh, we give our kids lots of warning when life is about to change and we're going to do something different. We tell them every day what the little schedule is going to be if it is out of the ordinary. And this is what works best because when we have consistency in our lives, we can trust the person who built that schedule. And that is how that child can start to develop attachment. Oh, I trust that mealtime will be at the same time. I trust that we will do my homework at the same time. I go to bed at the same time. Oh, I guess I can kind of trust these people a little bit because they're in charge of the schedule. Minimize electronic use. Here's another little um, platform I like to jump on, but please do this with your caregivers as much as you can encourage it. I, I'm not saying get rid of it, but you want to minimize how much use these kids have. Now I know kids in the United States really addicted to their devices. Woo, we all are. I am too. Uh, before COVID, when I traveled all the time, I traveled with two computers, often two tablets and two phones between work and my own personal stuff. And when I go on vacation, I do take a computer. I admit it. And that's fine. But I'm an adult. And I'm in control of my schedule. And my brain is not still developing as much as I might like for it to. 
Uh, but you want to minimize electronics because first of all, children's bodies and brains are developing a great deal, uh, especially up to age 18. And so those little brains get really wrapped around how electronics work with us. Why is it that from the 50s when television was invented, and no, I do not remember that, okay, this is, I just know that's when it was invented. Uh, we became very attached to TV. TV dinners started coming out. People started eating in front of the boob tube, as we used to call it, right? And I know that's a rude term, but that's what we often called it. And the bottom line is, why is that? Well, because electronics work with the pleasure centers of our brain. So like that really yummy chocolate might really give you a lift or giving you lots of exercise and you get on that runner's high or you have really great sex or you go to the casino and you win a little jackpot, even if it's only $5. If you've ever sat down at a slot machine and you win a little something, oh, the machine makes such fun sounds and they'll do fun things, right? It makes you wanna stay there and do more. And that's how it works with our brain. And so when we get pings on our phone or we see, oh, remember, of course, before uh, high-speed internet when we had modems and everybody had their AOL, right? And you'd hear, you've got mail. I still remember how that was like, oh, how exciting is this? Email, what is, what is email, right? <laughs> oh, this is so fun. Well, that's what it does to us. And when you're a child, it really does. And especially if you don't have a lot of relationship with people and you don't trust them, you're going to get quite attached to this device. And so we have to be careful. Girls have a tendency to get attached to social media highly and because they're very invested often in what others think of them and they're more social in that regard as to what the rest of the world is doing. And they like to send pictures of themselves. And of course, when you're talking about a 16 year old who's going on 10 in their maturity, oh dear, those sexting pictures can really start getting out of control. Someone says, what is our role in helping to facilitate these situations? If uh, you see kids on electronics, video games, et cetera, you want to intervene with the parent a little bit. Uh, I know you're not monitoring the home per se, like the DCYF worker, but you might just ask, and this could be routine for every family. So how much time is your kid spending on electronics? And you can find some articles out there if you want to share them on the benefits of not having that happen all the time. Like I said, you're not going to get this removed. I'm not saying, oh, don't let that child near a cell phone or a video game. Of course, that's not the reality of our world. But you want to know how many hours a day is this kid on there? Um, how do they act if you say no more? Do they go, oh, bummer, okay. Or do they have a big old, I'm in your face fit? Because I've had a lot of caregivers say to me, oh, Zia, when I grounded her and took her little phone away or I took away his video game, oh my gosh, I thought they were going to eat me alive, right? Well, that's a sign that somebody's way too attached to that little device. Here should be what goes on even from the first day a kid comes into a home. All electronics should be taken away fairly early in the evening, you know, say an hour or two before bedtime. And they should go either into a locked cupboard or they should go into the parents' bedroom and put on chargers. And you don't get it until the morning or you don't get it until you're in the car going to school or if they take a bus, maybe you say, you know what, you don't really need the cell phone at school. If you need to call me, go to the office. If the school won't allow that, because they think everybody has a cell phone. Well, that's something I guess you have to negotiate. But bottom line is, it can be really scary how attached our kids get to these things. And when they replace relationships with electronics, that's not good. And we see it in the adult world, right? There's a huge uptick in attachment to all these items. How many people sit at the table at, at a dinner in a restaurant with your, your spouse, perhaps, and you're busy looking at your phone and texting. My husband and I have been guilty of that, but you know, we're not kids and we've been, we've been with each other for a hundred years. So bottom line is though, we've got to really look at our kids. And of course, when you live with children, you've got to put down a pretty good example. You can't take all the phones away from your kid and then you sit there emailing for two hours 
or looking at cat videos on your favorite social media. So it's important that you have activities, old fashioned, let's do stuff together and let's make sure that we all understand electronics are not a right, they are a privilege. All right, three C's in foster care. I invented, invented this because we all can think of these things easier. Commit, claim, and connect, okay? The three C's of foster care and adoption. We wanna commit, claim, and connect. You commit to that child. So when parents come to trainings and they are doing the licensing process and the home studies, and they're wanting to do this, whether it's through adoption or foster care, they are committing to the idea of that child and they're committing that to their family. Then when that child's placed with them, they claim the child as their own as much as they can. They may not be adopting, uh, but it may be, this is, you know, this is my kid. You go to town with your kids, yep, here's my kid. You're not identifying them as the foster kid. And so help caregivers to know that, to not differentiate in that sense, except of course, when they're talking to you privately, but in public, you want to claim that kid is your own as much as you can, even though you may not feel it, right? You fake it till you make it to some degree. You help the parents know it's okay you're not attached yet, but let's just pretend you are and make that kid feel welcome. Put a picture of them on the wall. Um, of course, they should have as much furniture as any other child. They should have opportunities to go on vacation with the family. They should not be identified as a foster child to every person that you run into on the street. Understand rejection from a child. This kid is going to be rejecting because they don't trust you. And it is not the child's job to do all of the uh, work on attachment. That is mostly going to fall on the parent. Love is more than action than feeling. There are days, and let's be honest, folks, whether you are in a, a foster care situation, you have your own birth kids, you are in a committed relationship with an adult, there are days that we're all sorry about it, right? There are days, and you can admit this to me, I won't tell anybody, that you wish you weren't a parent. There are days that you wish you were not a spouse or you were not a committed partner to someone. I mean, let's be honest, if you've been in a relationship for more than five minutes, who hasn't woken up in the morning and looked over at that other pillow and gone, oh boy, you're still here, huh? <laughs> you know? But the next day, hopefully you don't say that, to, right? You don't say that to them. But the next day you may look over there and you go, oh boy, you're still here, yay, right? We have to remember that no matter what relationship it is, some days you go through the motions. This kid may be getting on your caregiver's last nerve, but you help them to know it's okay. Maybe they can call you. Maybe they can call their social worker if possible. Hey, I'm a resource for people as well. I hear from foster parents periodically. And you just say, it's okay. What can you do? Can maybe today you can't say, I love you or you're the best thing that's ever come across my door. But maybe you say, I really love your smile. I'm happy you're in my home. And the fact is that tomorrow's a new day. You're probably gonna feel a little bit better about it later. So we have to know love is more about just uh, not feeling it in the moment, right? And this is normal for all relationships. Parents have to decide to be committed even when they have days where they just don't want anything to do with any kid, much less the foster kid they don't know very well yet. And as an adult, encourage your caregivers to get their needs met elsewhere. I will shamelessly plug the fact that I run a support group virtually. That is one of the things they can do. Go to a support group and be honest about how you're feeling. I've run support groups for a better part of 20 years and people can come to the group and say, hey, today I wish I didn't have kids. That's okay. We're okay with that here. We understand that. The child's not here to, be, to overhear that, right? It's okay. Uh, have time with friends. Have a date night with your partner if they have a partner. If they don't, encourage your single caregivers to have regular babysitters. Well, everybody should, but they really need it because they need a break. So they need to get their adult needs met elsewhere. All right, we talked about the three C's. Here's the four T's. Trust, time, touch, and taste. Well, what are these things? 
First of all, you need time and trust to be built. It doesn't matter how perfect your families are. You can't make it all go away and be perfect within a couple of weeks or a couple of months. If you've got a child who's under age three, it's going to take at least six months to get a full attachment going and maybe not completely then. If you've got older kids in the home, caregivers just need to know this is going to take a while. It doesn't mean it's not going in the right direction. It's not meaning that things aren't going pretty darn well. But let's not pretend that we are fully attached to this child who's only been here for six or seven months when they're 12 years old, okay? Uh, you just have to be committed and just hang in there and look at the bigger picture. It's not whether I'm madly in love with this kid today, but I need to remember I am doing this because I wanna provide that child with consistency, with uh, care, with a uh, good uh, out, you know, with the best of health as possible, uh, with an education and with safety in our home and that consistency that comes with this. And of course, a family who is going to adopt, then they're providing them also with a legal forever family and name. Adults need to spend time with their kids. Every adult in the household should spend individual time with every child birth kids, adopted kids, foster kids, kinship. If maybe you've got a lot of kids in that home and you say, Zia, I'm, I'm working with a family with six kids. That doesn't sound realistic. Both parents work. Well, even 15 minutes a day can make a difference. You, you need milk? Hey, kiddo, why don't you come with me? Maybe you take two kids with you. Maybe you just take the one. Do you have a long driveway? I happen to have a long driveway. Uh, you know, do you want to walk down and get the mail with me? Great. Uh, would you help me bring in the groceries, right? And so how was your day while you do that? What did you learn today? Or what did you do today? Or what was your favorite part of today? What are you looking forward to tomorrow? Even giving kids that little bit of time, tucking them in, even if they're a teenager, just checking in on them. How you doing? How, how you doing today? You okay? You comfy? You warm enough? How's life, right? You just spend that individual time, even for a while with a child to give them that chance to talk to you, to share with you uh, what's going on. Quality and quantity count here. These kids have not had family consistently most of the time, right? And so, yes, we want to spend time with them and we want it to be some level of quality. And we need our caregivers to know, I know you want this kid to attach to you. I know you do. We want that. But we might need to outlast that longest placement. If this kid has been moved around a lot, don't expect that in two or three months, they're gonna really feel comfortable here. Um, if they were in their last placement for a year and then that parent didn't want them in their home anymore for whatever reason. And we have to remember that children, even though a parent may have a very good reason for why they're no longer parenting a child such as, well, we've gotten kind of old and we don't wanna be foster parents anymore. Or you know what, we've adopted some kids now and we need to just not have this huge, large family. Well, for a child that's being moved, it just feels like I'm being abandoned. There is no good reason. Uh, we're getting a divorce and I don't wanna be a foster parent by myself because I need to work full time and it's just not gonna work. Well, that kid's still gonna feel abandoned. So we need to know that they may need to kind of outlast that long displacement. Again, it doesn't mean things aren't going well but it will help a little bit when the child has been able to be there a while and say, oh, I've been here longer uh, than I was anywhere else. Play is so important. That is part of our four T's, right? Touch. We need to get in there, play with kids. We need to show them how to play, how to be together. So this is part of time. Uh, you want to play with those old fashioned toys like uh, board games and big rubber balls, bouncing it back and forth. Uh, you could get stress balls that the kids can play with, whatever they can do to have tactile experiences. Do they like to draw? Uh, do they want to chalk in the driveway? Do they um, enjoy crafting? I had a parent tell me recently she taught her 15-year-old foster daughter how to knit. And she said, most of the kids I've had have never wanted to do that. But this kid, she said within three months, she said, this kid was out knitting me and I've been doing it for years. 
So you never know what might grab their attention, right? Maybe they would love to plant a flower and watch it grow and take care of it. And then they'll be more interested in going out and doing a little gardening or, oh, we're going to get uh, raspberries at the end of this. Yummy, right? Uh, get those blocks out, whether it's little kids or bigger kids. I had a, a family uh, that the mom and the dad, let's see, they had a 13-year-old in their home and a three-year-old and a four-year-old. And so uh, they had a little playroom for the kids. And one day uh, the mom said, you know what, to the 13-year-old, she said, could you go in and just tidy up that playroom? It looks like a, a hurricane went through there. Could you just put the toys in the boxes for me, please? Because she was, mom was busy doing something. And so the girl goes in there and about an hour later, the mom realized she hadn't heard from the 13-year-old. So she goes in there and says, what you doing? Well, the girl was kind of sheepish, but she said, I'm playing. She was playing with some of the toys. And that's not unusual. And I'm sure you've seen it, that a lot of these kids are so much more immature due to the trauma they've experienced that their development actually was a little stunted and a little slowed. I know stunted is not a very good word, right? But it's a little slowed down in their development. And so a 13-year-old might seem like an eight-year-old in how they like to play with toys. That's okay. Go back to the beginning. If they want to sit and play with blocks or Legos, great. Let them do it. They want to color the basic coloring books, go for it. If they want to look at uh, comic books, graphic novels, if you will, that's good too because at least they're reading, right? And so these are the things that we want to do to interact with these kids and encourage them to have a relationship with us. And of course, touch. We need affection. We need to be connected as mammals. If we do not have that when we are tiny, even if we're fed, we often have failure to thrive and we may die as mammals. Uh, tiny kittens, puppies, everybody needs that loving touch from another mammal. And so children need to be touched, especially if they've been neglected or abused. This will cut through and build trust and attachment much more quickly. Think about when you're on the street, or maybe for some of you, and maybe it wasn't even that long ago, but you're in a new relationship with somebody you're dating, and you just can't keep your hands off that person. And oh my goodness, everybody's like, get a room, right? Well, that's what we do when we're attaching. We are all huggy-huggy. And when we have infants, nature has put us in such adorable bodies when we are tiny that we can't help but want to hold them and cuddle them and kiss on their little faces and touch that soft skin or that soft fur, right? I'm a crazy cat lady. We have a lot of cats around here. We always have animals. Um, you always want to do that right? And so that's a good thing because that way we take care of those needs. Well, children who are older are a little harder to attach to because this is nature. If we could attach to 12-year-olds and 20-year-olds as easily as we do babies, well, the uh, human population would never have developed because we'd be 40 years old living with our parents sitting on their lap Nobody would ever leave home. We would have all died out, right? You're, when you're a parent, you have that infant and somebody says, oh my gosh, they're going to go to college before you know it, right? Somebody's laughing. Yeah, I miss doing these classes in person. I can't tell if you all think I'm being funny or just weird <laughs> or both. But you, know, you, you say to a parent with that baby, they're going to go to college and they're going to grow up so fast. And that parent says, Oh my, to themselves perhaps, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine what my, my baby growing up and getting away from me. I can't even begin to imagine that, right? But then when your child is a little bit older, maybe three years old or even earlier, you might think I could do with a few hours away from them. And then when they're 13 and maybe they've got kind of a snotty attitude and you're just no longer cool, well, yeah, I'm okay with you being in school all day. And in fact, maybe we could send you to camp for a week or two and you want to have an overnight with a friend at their house? Okay, I'm good for that. And a lot of times by the time college rolls around, you can't wait to get that kid out 
and make that room into something else, right? It doesn't mean you don't love your child, but that's the way nature builds us so that we can continue the species and so that our poor parents won't absolutely die when we move away from home. I know there is the empty nest syndrome, but the fact is it's a lot easier to let go of your 20 year old than it is your two year old. And so we have to work with these children and we need to recognize they need those hugs just as much as babies do, but they may not like it and they may not trust you. So what do you do? Well, you encourage your caregivers to be creative, uh, pat them on the back when they walk by squeeze their shoulder when they're sitting on the couch and you walk by, ruffle their hair, unless it really bugs them. Uh, teenagers may not like their hair being ruffled. Uh, let's see, if they are okay with hugs, do what I call a drive-by hug. You give them a real quick hug and then you let go and keep going before they have a chance to protest. You might tuck them in at night, right? You just pull the covers up, you pat their little shoulder, um, they may not want kisses, or maybe they will accept a little kiss on the forehead. You brush their hair. You say, oh my gosh, this lotion smells amazing. What do you think? Oh, let me hear it. Let me put some on your hand for you. And you give them a little hand massage. All of these things are ways to help that child develop a healthy touch relationship. And of course, when you do have a caregiver who has a child who wants hugs, Oh gosh, go for it, go for it, go for it. Hugs, 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 uh, maybe some kisses. Maybe you play with them and you pick up that young one and you kiss them on the neck, right? And you do the little growly thing and you give them little bites and things that we do or you do the fake bites of the fingers and all those things that we do with babies but we need and toddlers, but we need to do with sometimes a little older kid. Now don't do tickling, no tickling. Tell your male caregivers, no tickling. Uh, that, that is not acceptable. That can be really out of boundaries and that can cause uh, some children to get really traumatized. No wrestling either. Don't get into wrestling because you may have done it with your own kids and that's great, but with children with trauma who have uh, boundary issues, that can go south really fast and that can create uh, some physical interactions. So we don't want that to happen where we have a kid who turns aggressive because they're suddenly scared. But you just want to encourage your uh, caregivers to find out ways to attach to that child. And here's a secret of attachment I'm gonna share with you. When we treat children younger because they are showing us that younger behavior, we actually will attach faster because nature has us work faster with younger people. And this is why it can be hard to parent a teen, because when you have a child that's uh, placed in your home through adoption or because of birth, well, you know them when they were babies. And when they become that kind of annoying 13 year old, parents can remember when they were adorable babies and toddlers, or when they were the six year old that would say, mom, I'm never moving away from home, right? And that kind of keeps you going through those teen years when a lot of parents would like to put their kids in the freezer for a few years and just stop time. Um, so when caregivers can see that child acting like that nine-year-old and they cater to that a little bit with a hug or they brush their hair or they go up to the counter of McDonald's and they uh, have the child close at their side and they help them order that hamburger things that you think that child of that age should know how to do, right? Then that helps the parent attach faster because they're making memories of that little person who's inside. Our children in care are a great deal like Russian nesting dolls, right? Those dolls that have the drawing on the outside and it's kind of a shapeless container and you pull open the container and there's the exact same doll inside, but it's smaller. It's not a doll really, it's just a painted container. And then you open that container, there's more in there, right? That's what these kids are like. They have those little ones inside that somebody needs to nurture. And when you can help your caregivers understand that they may be chronologically 11 years old, but in many ways, they're like a six-year-old, then they can help to attach faster and do more for that child. Okay. Recognize taste. This is important. 
We uh, need to know that our children have simple tastes. Don't let food become a battleground. Offer lots of choices and offer lots of healthy small snacks often. Do not limit food. So taste is one of the four T's, right? We want to make sure that our children know they're going to be fed, they're not going to go without, and we are going to be the people that provide that. So this is very important. And if you have not had a chance to hear my food and hygiene training, I will be offering that in future months to the CASAs again. And so please uh, feel free. Or actually, Ryan's going to have, he's got that recorded. Hello, I offered that on Monday night. So he will have that recorded. You can listen to it soon uh, just to get some more ideas, okay? Child care. I know kids in foster care, their parents may work. Nobody expects them to be home. But you want to encourage uh, daycare at all possible to be with someone that might have a little bit of an understanding of some of the issues these kids experience. Ryan said it's up on the website, that, that training, if you're interested in it. Uh, group settings can be very comfortable to a child who's not attached. So these are the kids that go to a large daycare and they have no problem blending in. They don't care because they don't really have relationship uh, expectations of anybody. And so you really do want to have that one-on-one -on -one when you can. And if you have a choice, if a caregiver has a choice, encourage them to go uh, to a small daycare or smaller one if there's a choice. I know there's not always a choice available. But if you're talking about a family who's moving towards adoption or kinship that may have more of those choices, then that's something to encourage. Remember to encourage them to parent the emotional age. When that child was first traumatized by being removed from their family or abused or greatly neglected, they probably slowed their development way down they look fine on the outside, but on the inside, they're really slow. And so we need to understand that parents should parent the emotional age. It will not slow down a child's development, trust me. It will not make them an old fashioned term of a mama's boy, right? Or a mama's girl, okay? It, what it will do is help move that development along in a normal pattern and it will help build trust and attachment. Caregivers are reparenting. They need to know this. That's why it's good to go back and let a child be snuggly with you, to not say things like, you're too old for that. You're too old to need a nightlight. You're too old for me to go up and help order a McDonald's hamburger, right? No, 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 no. Maybe nobody's done that with them. They are not too old for that. They're not too old to lean against you on the couch. Uh, they're not too old for those types of things. And so encourage caregivers to not say that to children, but to recognize that little person is showing you what they need or that big person. I had a kid who was placed at age 12 with a family and I, he was a, a little guy when he was first there because he was age 12, but he'd come from another country. And so he looked more like an eight or nine year old. And bottom line, there's a question on the chat for you, Ryan. And, uh, this kid, he loved being with this new family. He'd come from an orphanage where he lived his entire life. And this family learned some of these techniques. And boy, they were so good at showing this kid affection. And he would sit on their laps. And, you know, she said that sometimes when he was older, he was 16, if he had a bad day at school, he might still come home and lean up against her and put his head on her shoulder and cuddle with her like he was, you know, 10 years old because he still had that little person inside that needed that nurturance. And so uh, this would help him. And then 10 minutes later, he'd get up and be like, can we go to the mall now? You know, Cause he'd then go back in his chronological age of wanting to go to the mall. But there were times that they saw he still was that little kid because he'd spent 12 years living in an orphanage and not having some of those needs met. You wanna be an emotional container, which this comes from the National uh, Trauma Network. And basically, this means is you allow that child to share their concerns with you. Uh, you let them say things like, I hate my mom right now. She's never at our visit. Well, instead of saying, you don't hate your mom, you say, I understand. This is really hard that you can't see her. Or I'm really mad at you because I don't want to be grounded. Or how dare you take away my video game? Hey, I get it. I know it's not fun. I don't want to do it. But you know, this is what needs to happen. 
And so you let them vent, you let them be frustrated, uh, but you are there to still care about them and accept. And that's what you want your caregivers to know. And when they need, of course, to let's have somebody be their emotional container, then that's where they need to go find the groups, talk to friends about their struggles, uh, talk to you, talk to people and have their own support system because they need it too. You want kids to be able to do time ins, hopefully with a family, not time outs, but sometimes time outs work better for some of these kids. So I don't dis, uh, discount that at all. Have your parents make a big fuss over every little hurt. Oh, ouchie, let's go put a Band-Aid on that. I don't care if they're a 14 year old boy. Owie, that looks like it needs a little peroxide. Let's go put a little peroxide and clean it up or, or you know, something that doesn't burn. Uh, let's put a little Neosporin and a little Band-Aid. I personally think Band-Aids cure everything. <laughs> uh, daily cuddle time and whatever that looks like with this kid. Uh, constant praise, talking about thank you for setting the table, uh, they, you know, even though you asked them to do it, or thank you for putting all your clothes in the hamper, even though you asked them to do it and you reminded them, but thank you for doing that. Um, wow, you are a really good artist. Wow, you are so good about getting out there and catching the bus on time, right? Talk about emotions. Talk about how you're happy they're in the home. Or yes, you know, you hurt my feelings yesterday with what you said. Um, oh gosh, I'm sorry that your feelings are hurt because of what your friend said to you. And talk about your role with these people, right? Someone said Band-Aids, ice packs, and hugs fix everything. There you go. That's right. Um, maybe the other thing could be too, if they have some scary monsters in their room, you fill up a water ball, a bottle, spray bottle, and you can spray away the monsters for little kids. Your 16 year olds probably aren't going to buy it. <laughs> you could try. <laughs> Let's talk about school real quick. I know I'm going on. See, I love this topic too much. An emotionally delayed child is not able to progress. So a child who is struggling from trauma, who is not feeling uh, secure in the home, they're not gonna get a lot out of school. So caregivers need to know it is not their job to catch this kid up academically. They can do what they can do, but they need to be prepared to be a parent first. And if that child is really resistant to doing homework with the parent and really doesn't want to do that and really gets oppositional about that, I encourage caregivers to get some sort of tutor to do that with the child because it is really challenging uh, to be a parent and a teacher at the same time. And their role is to be a teacher first and to recognize that we just may not make a lot of headway in this first uh, few months with this kid because learning a new school and a new family at the same time is pretty darn hard. Uh, so encourage them not to take on that burden of, oh my gosh, I gotta catch this kid up in school as well as try and attach to them. Recognize that challenging days can come with birth family relationship that makes the child feel very torn, anniversaries, birthdays, holidays, school changes, adding new kids to the family, court dates, so many things can trigger children in their stress. And so caregivers, you can help remind them, oh, you know, they had a visit with their therapist the other day, right? Well, maybe that's why they're acting out more. Oh, they had a visit with their uh, birth parent the other day. Yeah, that might be what's causing some of this. So help the caregiver know that this can be why these kids can go up and down and all of these things can really impact the child. Help our caregivers to know they need that parent who is an adult. You're stronger, wiser, bigger you know, than the child, that you're gonna be that wall that is gonna help absorb some of that stuff that child is dealing with. That they're not expecting that foster child to meet their parenting fantasies. That's not what the kid's there for and they just don't need that burden put upon them. And so they need to recognize that and remember it and know that they are the parent. And that doesn't mean being the kid's friend all the time, right? It means sometimes, though, that you are that solid wall that will always be consistent. Uh, we certainly need to recognize that even when the child's going home, that attachment is something that will go to the family, that it will benefit everyone when this child is going back to the birth family. We know it's hard. 
acknowledge with your caregivers how it might hurt them, how it may hurt their other kids that this child's going home and encourage them to get support for themselves and not be too quick to take in new children when they're still grieving the loss of you know, Teddy that went home two weeks ago. So helping them to understand and helping that child to know, I'm gonna miss you, but I'm so glad you were here and I will always remember you and hopefully we will be able to have some connection you know, in the future maybe. Help them to remember bonding doesn't occur overnight. Relationships take time with all ages of children, not just the older ones, but little ones too. Delight in the journey of today, not what you expect that kid to be, but what they are today. Accept them for who they are and know that just because you don't love them doesn't mean that they're not a good caregiver. If they're, they're struggling with love, that's okay. It doesn't mean you might not still be one of the best caregivers this child's ever had because you are working on trust and building confidence for that child and you're empathizing with them. The fact you're not madly in love with them yet, that's okay. It's okay. And remember that it takes commitment, time, tears, laughter, flexibility, acceptance, and love to build a family. And I've had, I mean, I've done this list for years and I've had some parents who said, you know what, Zia, I put that in my uh, bedroom side drawer next to my bed. And when my kid's really making me crazy, I look at this and remember uh, of what I need to do. And I had a parent years ago that uh, they weren't under my supervision, but I knew them. They had a lot of kids. They were the parents that adopted really tough teenagers that adopted kids who had been in the judicial system. They adopted children with really hard health issues, right? Children who had a lot of disability. And they had probably 10 kids and then they had fostered a whole bunch too. And I said to this dad, and he, they were a little older by the time I met them. Uh, and uh, I said, you wanna tell me what I could say to new parents? You know, what's some tips that you have? And he said, oh, it's not that hard, Zia. He said, really? He said, you just need to keep showing up. He said, these kids need to see the same face every day and they need to know even when they drive you crazy and you might go to bed mad, he said, because sometimes it's hard not to. Bottom line is they're gonna see you at breakfast and they're gonna see you after school. So these kids don't need perfection from these caregivers. They need them to just keep showing up. Okay. Remember, of course, coordinated care is there to help provide therapy for your family uh, that may need help. So those kids are on coordinated care. That includes behavioral health. We can help them find a therapist. So, but I want to leave you with that little tidbit. I am now going to give you the PowerPoint. I'm so impressed I was able to keep it within that hour and a half here. Uh, so if you have questions or comments, feel free to type them in or speak out loud while I dig up my PowerPoint for this and put it in the box for you. And of course, I always have way too many things in my files here, there it is. It's a PDF for you that you can go through. I also will shamelessly put in my support group flyer. You can share this with your caregivers. Kinship, attach, uh, adoption, and foster care are welcome to attend. Uh, we generally do it twice a month. I should say I do it twice a month. Not, there's, no, there's not a we there. <laughs> I do it. And in November, there's only one due to time frames, et cetera. Uh, but Mostly we do it, there's two in December and there will be new dates put out of the, on the new flyer. And I'm gonna give you my email. If you're having a hard time grabbing the PowerPoint and you want it, or you have a question later or a comment, or you know a group that could benefit from our trainings, you are welcome to contact me at any time. Zia Freeman, Zia.Freeman at coordinatedcarehealth.com. And of course, Ryan knows how to get a hold of us too. All right. So any questions or comments before we let you go forth?
Someone said, how hard is it for coordinated care to approve a secondary mental health provider? Uh, what do you mean by secondary? I have a kiddo right now that um, is currently being seen by the WISE program. Yes. Um, but she's gonna need um, more in-depth actual mental health treatment. Sure. So um, the social workers placed a referral to coordinated care to approve, um, get the get the process rolling to see if we could get approval for payment for a secondary mental health provider. You mean someone to see while they're going to WISE? Mm-hmm. Okay. You know what? That that honestly, that part of the not my specialty in regards to the coverage for that. So it sounds like though the wise providers already done what they need to do. Now, if you find that there is a problem or a concern or the wise provider who is putting this through is getting some weird response that they don't understand, uh, you are always welcome to contact me and I can find out, I can go behind the scenes and poke the bear, if you will, and see where we need to figure out a glitch. And that's for anything. If any of your families say, I thought this was covered with coordinated care or I got a bill or something. Uh, first of all, I recommend you call our main number. That would be my first recommendation, but then I'm always a backup resource if we need help, okay? So it sounds like the WISE providers doing what, what they need to do to get this in motion. And then, cause of course we work and provide WISE all the time. Uh, then someone said, how do I as a cost evaluate if my kiddo in a group home has attachment challenges? Well, <laughs> uh, probably they do. How's that for a short answer? Oh, ask the staff. Ask them, what do you think in regards to attachment? Find out if you can the past history. Why is that child in a group home? That's probably a part of it. Those behaviors came from somewhere. I'm mean, not to say that a child who's a ch kids to be attached and have behavioral challenges, of course, but that is a lot to do with it when there's no trust there. So find out from the staff, say, you know, I suspect this child's got some attachment issues, right? So tell me what you think they are. And the staff should be able to identify that. If you see odd behaviors with that child when you're talking to them, uh, this can be there, but you know, you're going to get that history from the notes in regards to previous foster homes. I'm assuming that child's been in foster families. That's where it shows up. And that's a good question because the hard part is that children sometimes with attachment concerns, they go into group homes and they do quite well. They do quite well because they know these are staff. These are not, these are not parents. Uh, we're all kind of treated the same, right? So they often do very well and group homes are very consistent and they are rule driven. And so children often feel rather secure there, even though they're not building attachment necessarily with any individual. And so then we place them in a foster home because of course they're doing great in a group home and it falls apart. And sometimes it is actually the relationship, it is the struggle with attachment that is causing the post-traumatic stress disorder. I know that sounds terrible, right? But if you've had a lot of relationships that have fallen apart and you don't understand your part in any of that, you're a child, you really didn't do it, it can be tough. And just being told, we're gonna put you now with a new mom and or dad can send a kid reeling. So uh, that's the hard part when you've got kids that are doing perfectly in a group home and then they go into a family and it kind of falls apart. They, yeah, and you say they've got developmental delays too, you're adding to it. They need to go to a family who is not relying on that child to build a strong attachment with them. They can be a strong, caring caregiver, but not expect that kid to just fall into their arms to be that fantasy child, right? They need to understand their developmental delays and they need to know that this kid relies on you to be consistent and to be boring in the sense that our rules are very clear and we do the same thing at the same time. Obviously a home does not run like a residential unit, but the closer they can imitate some of those rules, the better they are. And in the meantime, talk to the staff there and just put it to them. 
What do you see as attachment issues for this child? Or what do you know about their past history that brought them here in regards to attachment? Great question. Okay, folks, any other comments? Thank you, Zia. You have my email. Thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, hopefully you benefited from this training. And thank you again, Ryan, for having me do four trainings with you this week. I hope that all of you uh, enjoy the rest of your conference uh, tomorrow and of course next week. I probably will be participating as a participant myself in a couple of things. So thank you tonight, and uh, we will see you at the next training that may be offered for the CASAs that I will be doing monthly. So thanks again tonight, and go hug somebody, everybody. Good night.